Well, good morning. I hope you guys are doing well. Welcome. Glad you chose to join us for the service and for the funeral of my March Madness bracket. Anybody else in the same struggle? The struggle is real. And uh, speaking about struggle, uh, we're in the middle of a series called Power Struggles. And um, the reason why this series is called Power Struggles is because when Brandon sat down with his creative team about six months ago, and they planned out our series as we walked through the book of John, uh, they came to John chapter 19 and 20, and what they saw is just a series of power struggles. We've been talking about that. We'll see it again today. What we see in these chapters is people have this power struggle typically that begins within them. That's where it always begins, right? What they want, and so that struggles within them, that tension's there. And then that tension creates a power struggle with somebody else. In this case, in these chapters, it's, it's a struggle within people who are then struggling with Jesus. That's the person they're struggling with. And Jesus, being God, ultimately means they're struggling with God himself. And the same holds true for every one of us. Uh, we all have our power struggles. They begin within us. Then they typically go between us and somebody else. And then ultimately, a lot of times, it ends up resulting between us and God. And so today... Uh, the power struggle we're specifically going to be talking about is, is the one for control. All right, so we're going to talk about the, the power struggle for control and how we all want control, but we don't have it. So there's good news and there's bad news, right? Uh, the good news is we serve a God who is in control. That's great news. Uh, the bad news is we are not in control, and that drives us crazy. And there's always a few in the room, it never fails, like, oh, no, I don't deal with that. Like, so you're sitting here right now, somebody's like, I don't deal with control. Well, you're lying, okay? And uh, here's a test for you to, to check how much you struggle with control. This is what I want you to do. If you don't think you struggle with control, when you leave here in a little bit, I want you guys to jump on Highway 90, and I want you to drive for five miles. I, I don't care which direction you go, and you're going to see very, very quickly that you have a desire for control. Uh, there's going to be somebody going by you that's speeding, and you're going to want to control the speed that they're going. Uh, there's going to have somebody in front of you that's turning, and they don't use their blinker. I'm sorry for that, by the way. I am really bad about that. Uh, you're going to want to control that. There's going to be somebody that the, the light is red, and they're going to blow right through it, almost cause a problem. You're going to want to control them. Uh, there's going to be somebody else that's kind of like swerving back and forth. You're going to get by them. They're on their phone, and you're going to control that. There's going to be somebody like happened to me this morning on the way here. Somebody's like right on my tailgate, you know, like right there. It's like, dude, pass me, you know. They're right there, and you're gonna, you want to control that. In, in fact, in those five miles, you're going to be so frustrated that you can't control somebody. There's a possibility, you know, that you're going to get frustrated enough that you're going to honk your horn at them. And then you're going to even want to control their response. In your control, you're going to want them to roll down the window, stick their hand out, wave, and say, I'm sorry, yes, I'm a horrible driver. That's what you want. If you're in control, that's what would happen. But in reality, what's going to happen is they're going to stick their hand out the window, and they're going to tell you that you're number one, and it's going to drive you crazy because <laughs> that's not what you wanted. We, we all want control. And, and so here's just kind of a sidebar while we're talking about driving. Uh, this is me. Uh, I'm not representing the leadership here at Mosaic Church. This is my stance. Uh, a lot of you guys are driving around right now with a Mosaic sticker on the back of your vehicle. And so let me, let me just chat with you real quick, okay? If you tend to speed, if you tend to not use your blinker, if you tend to tailgate and all these different things, and you have that sticker on your vehicle, it's okay. Just keep it on there. It's cool. Because here's the deal. We want people to know that normal people go to Mosaic Church, even sinful people. This is really important. But if you have that sticker on the back of your vehicle, and you're that dude that travels in the left lane, making sure all of us have to slow down and pass you on the right, I need you to rip that sticker off. It is one thing for people in the community to know that we're sinful. It's something different for them to know that we're idiots, okay? So fix that problem for us. So here's the deal. We, we all want control. And maybe it's not driving. Maybe it's something else. There's actually phrases uh, for different people that like control. Let's throw this one out there. You guys ever heard the phrase or the, the title, Bridezilla? You guys know that? Some guys, it's always, there's one dude always laughs at that. Uh, you're in trouble when you get home, buddy. So, uh, Bridezilla is somebody who's like trying to control the wedding, and they try to control everything, and they make everybody miserable in the process. Have you guys ever heard the phrase, the title, helicopter parents? 
These are people who try to control everything for their kids and what goes on there. Have you ever heard the phrase, a nag? A nag is a spouse. It could be a husband or a wife who's trying to control their spouse, tell them what to do. The list goes on and on. In fact, in the business world, uh, there's a position and, and their job is to be in charge of the finances, the expenditures and everything else. You know what their title is? The controller, exactly. And, and so there's a controller for everything. We all try to control, but here's, here's the fact of the matter, guys. Uh, the truth of the matter is this. No matter how hard we try, we cannot control everything. But there is one, we're going to talk about this more, that does have everything in control. And thankfully, his motives are a whole lot purer than ours are. And so today we're going to be in, in John chapter 9. We're going to be focusing on verse 28 to 37. And uh, what's really interesting, just kind of preface this before we get there, because we're going to go to these verses and I'm like, well, really? We're studying these today? So one of the beauties uh, of walking through Scripture like we do, uh, verse by verse, is sometimes we end up studying verses that we wouldn't normally study at that particular time, because it just we might think it doesn't fit. Now, the verses we're talking about today is literally Jesus' death on the cross. Uh, and, and we sit there saying, man, this doesn't really fit this time because these verses are typically relegated for like the week before Easter or, or for a good Friday service. But because we walk in verse by verse, we tackle the verses that are in front of us. So that means here in a few weeks, Brandon has to figure out what in the world he's going to teach when it comes to Easter. Uh, but here's the good news. God's in control, and it's not my problem. So that's always great. Verse 28 through 30 in John 19, let's go and get going. It says this, it says, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that Scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he'd received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Now, if you've uh, been here the past few weeks, you know what, what's been happening the days leading up to this event. You know that the days leading up to this event that Jesus had been captured. Uh, you know that Jesus had been beaten, that he'd been mocked, and that he'd been told to carry this cross piece, this part of the cross, uh, up a hill. And if you know this story, you know that the hours leading up to this event, what we just read, you know that the Soldiers nailed Jesus' feet and his hands to the cross, and they hoisted him up far above the earth. And at this point, he's literally hanging on this cross. And if you know the story, you know that on the surface, it looks really ugly. It looks really horrible. In a lot of ways, it's really easy to look at the days leading up to this event and this event and think, man, this is a tragic ending uh, to the God of this world. But here's the thing I want to talk to you guys about today. Uh, this event was far from tragic. As ugly and horrible as, as the pain and the death was, it is arguably the most beautiful event in all of human history, and there's two things that make it that. First, it, it is the means by which our sins are paid for, and the opportunity for us to have a relationship with God is made possible. See, as ugly and horrible as this whole event looks like on, on the surface, if it wasn't for that, we would never be able to have a relationship with God. Because we never have a sin payment for, for all the wrongs that we've done. We would never be able to experience eternity in heaven with God if it wasn't for this event. And that's what makes it beautiful. And here's the second thing, and this is really important. Uh, the second thing that makes this event beautiful was this. Jesus was not a victim on that cross. See, so often we might sit there and look at this thing and say, well, all this was pressed upon Jesus. This was a circumstance that he had to go through. And so God really kind of had a choice at that point. He had, to, he had to take this bad situation and figure out how to make it good. That's not what happened. This is something that Jesus planned, and this is something that Jesus had control of, even to his death. John Piper, a pastor, been a pastor for years, a phenomenal one wrote a lot of books, and, and he says this a, a lot better than I do. So let's just listen to what he has to say. He says, if we were to look at Jesus' death merely as a result of a betrayer's deceit and the Sanhedrin's envy and Pilate's spinelessness and the soldier's nails and spear, it might seem very involuntary. And the benefit of salvation that comes to us who believe might be viewed as God's way of making a virtue out of a necessity. He goes on, he says, but Jesus was not accidentally entangled in a web of injustice, the saving benefit to sinners like us, and he appointed, uh, 
I'm, so, I'm sorry. God planned it out out of his infinite love to sinners like us, and he appointed a time. Jesus, who was the very embodiment of his Father's love for sinners, saw that the time had come and set his face to fulfill the mission, to die in Jerusalem for our sake. No one takes my life from me, Jesus said. I lay it down on my own accord. All right, obviously hooked on phonics did not work for me. See, uh, here, here's the deal. Because Jesus was in control of the whole situation, he was in control of every aspect of the situation. He, he was even in control of, of, the, of the timing of his death. John said it this, we just read it, he says, when, when Jesus, he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and, and he gave up his spirit. Now, I want to come back in a little bit to talk about God's control. But before we do that, I want to focus on a word that we just read, a word that Jesus proclaimed on that cross, arguably the most powerful word in, in all of human history. When Jesus was on that cross, he used the word finished. Did you catch that? He was on the cross. He says, it is finished. And then he gave up his life. I mean, what an, what an amazing word, what an amazing phrase that Jesus came to earth from the heavenly realms, being God, was always God, but came and, and took on the identity as a man as well, and to walk among people for 33 years, and to live a sinless life, and he came with a purpose, and his purpose was to live a sinless life, and, and his purpose was to die at the hands of people he created so that he could be the ultimate sin sacrifice, and Jesus came to accomplish all these things, and Jesus said boldly, it is finished. He, he, he didn't quit until everything was finished. He didn't quit until everything he planned on doing came to fruition. He didn't quit until his ultimate goal was done. I mean, what an amazing phrase. What an amazing claim. A, a gentleman named Paul, Paul was a, a New Testament believer. He actually became an apostle. Uh, we're told in Scripture that one day he was uh, walking down the street. He was actually going to, to persecute Christians. And he ran into Jesus. And this is the crazy part. Jesus had already been killed on the cross. So this was the resurrected Jesus. And so Paul, on his way to persecute Christians, ran into Jesus. And Jesus says, you're going to follow me now. Paul says, yeah, yes, I am. And so what happens is Paul becomes a believer. And then Paul starts going on these missionary journeys. God used him in mighty ways. He started multiple churches. And, and God wrote through him much of the New Testament that we have today. And Paul had the same phrase that Jesus had. See, a, a time came where, where Paul was writing his last book that he wrote. It was actually to a man named Timothy. And in this last book that he was writing, he was actually in prison. He was, he was facing certain death. And he didn't write to Timothy. He says, hey, come get me. Oh, man, I'm not done yet. He didn't say any of this. This is what he said, 2 Timothy 4, 7. He says this. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I mean, isn't that a, a, an amazing claim? Isn't that a, a, an amazing thing to be able to say to God, say, they're saying, hey, here's the deal. I'm not perfect, God. I messed up more times than I would ever want to admit. But there's going to be a day that we, we die and we stand before Jesus, and we're going to go to heaven because of Christ's blood on us, because we believed in him, and so we're going to have salvation, but we're going to answer for our deeds, and could you imagine during that day sitting there looking at God and saying, you know what, there's so many things I wish I would have done different, but here's what I do believe, God. I believe that like Jesus said, and I believe that like Paul said, man, I kept the faith. I, I fought the fight. I didn't win every fight, but I sure made sure they know they were in one. I, I, I kept the faith, and, and, and I finished the race that you set before me. See, here's the deal, God, I'm not perfect, but you know, you put me in that job, and I didn't always enjoy that job, but I knew that, that you had a purpose for me there, and, and so I finished the goal you set before me. I made sure that people knew who you were. I made sure that I was the best employee I could possibly be. You know, God, you, you gave me kids, and kids, they're, they're the biggest blessing, God, but they're a challenge as well, too, and, and God, I'm raising them in the 21st century in a culture and a world where everybody's running towards sin, and parents are condoning sin, and they're even helping their kids sin, but, but God, I finished the fight. I finished the race. I, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't encourage my kids to get involved in that, and I certainly didn't make ways for them. So God, I did everything I can to finish so that I was a good steward of the kids you gave me. 
Or as a husband stand for God, say, you know what, God, you blessed me with an amazing wife, and, and I strove to love her like Christ loves the church. Like you tell me in Ephesians 5, God, I did everything I could to finish this race. And to say those words, and Scripture tells us a very real reality for some people, not all, but for some. God's going to look at us and say, you know what, you're right. And he's going to proclaim a truth over us, a title over us. He's going to say that we are good and that we were faithful. I mean, isn't that what life's all about? I mean, even in the midst of us focusing so much on what's going on right here, when it's all said and done, isn't it all about that moment that we stand before God? And we proclaim, I tried to take advantage of every opportunity you gave me. I tried to be faithful. I tried to fight the fight. And I tried to finish well. I, I mean, the, the struggle with that is, is a lot of us won't be able to make that claim if we don't control the struggle that exists within us. Specifically, this idea that we live in this world simply to be happy. And so what happens is because we want to be happy, we try to control everything. We try to make sure that we're comfortable. We try to control and make sure that we're having fun. We don't really take many risks in life because if I can't see a, a predetermined outcome that's what I desire, then I'm not going to do that. And so I try to control everything. You know, there's a reason why our kids are involved in the bubble wrap generation. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but that's true. It, it, and so what happens is we try to control everything, but what happens when our desire for control collides with God's plan and God's control in our lives? What happens when, when our desire for fun is replaced with trials? What happens when, when our plan for our life collides with God's better plan for our life? What, what happens when, when our desire to control everything collides with the one who really has all authority and control in this world. What do we do? Do we, do we rebel against God? Do we complain about it? Or do we, like Paul and Jesus, say, you know what? I'm going to take this world. I'm going to take this life. I'm going to do everything I can to finish it well. Are we going to follow 2 Corinthians 5, 7 that gives us the directive to live by faith and not by sight? You know what that means? You know what it means to live by faith and not by sight? It, it means to, to live in such a way that you invite God into whatever's going on because you view whatever God's brought into your life, catch this, as an opportunity and not as a problem. That, that's what that means. See, I, I hope this is really clear because there, there's really one main point I'm trying to make to everybody today is I really believe with all my heart that the dividing line between our ability to look at God and say, I finished well, and not being able to say that I finished well is the level to which we accept God's control. And then we respond to God's control in a godly way. We respond to God's control by, by being uh, as sinless as possible. We, we respond to God's control out of respect and admiration for who he is. See, uh, in fact, theologians, they have a word for God's control. It's called his sovereignty. And this is what it means, God's sovereignty. This, it, it refers to the attribute by which God rules his entire creation. I'm going to say it one more time. It, it's, it's the attribute by which God rules his entire creation and in, his, in control of everything that happens. Now, the reason why I, I focused on his creation is because there's only one thing in this world that God's not in control of, and that's sin, because God did not create sin. Sin is a, is a product of us and the fallen people that we are. So thus, he, he is not in control of sin. He has not created sin. He does not condone sin. He does not endorse sin, and he does not make us sin. However, he is the one who is responsible and in control of the consequences that we face because of sin. See, if I haven't made it clear already, the, the, the struggle that so many of us have, this power struggle that's within us that, that results with this tension with us and, and then ultimately tension with other people, and then lastly, tension with God, is this desire to control everything. And the idea of God being in control, a lot of us hate that. It drives us crazy. Now, we wouldn't admit it out loud, but it's true. Because if God's in control, young people catch this, if God's in control, then he's in, in control of what is right and wrong, and you are not. And we love to be in control of what's right or wrong, because if I can be in control of what's right or wrong, then I can have freedom to do whatever I want to do. And I believe with all my heart that if I have freedom to do whatever I want to do, then I'm going to have peace. But here's the deal. You're not going to have peace. If you go against God's word and what it says is right or wrong, you're going to have bondage. That's what you're going to have. But a lot of us struggle with that. 
Because we want to be able to dictate what's right for our life and what's wrong for our life. Uh, The second reason why we don't like God's control is because that means if he's in control, then he's he's in control of the circumstances that come into my life. That means he's he's in control of the blessings that come into my life, and he's in control of the timing of everything in my life. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a confession time. Not you. I'll do it. All right. Uh, I really struggle with this type of control right here. I mean, big time. Uh, I'm sharing this not because I'm proud of it, but I'm guessing a lot of you guys fall in the same category. I I really don't. As crazy as it is, I don't struggle with the circumstances. I, there's a way, that, like, when God brings a circumstance, like, man, here we go, dude, we got this. You know, God, you, you got it, and I'll, I'll follow. But I struggle with the timing. Man, I want things done now. I don't pray for patience. I pray for long suffering, because that's how it feels. And, and the struggle is, this is what's really crazy about me, and I'm guessing some of you as well. The things I like to control are often the biggest blessings in my life. You know, like the bridezilla tries to control her wedding, which is a huge blessing. I try to control all the other blessings in my life just like she does. Uh, You know, right now at work, we have some amazing blessings going on. And and, and because I can't control the timing, it's driving me crazy. One of the biggest blessings is we're starting a new campus in Harrison County. God's already brought us an amazing staff for that campus. It's going to be great. God's going to use this in amazing ways. I cannot wait to see what happens. But here's the problem. We don't have a building yet. We don't, have, we don't have one to rent. We don't have one to buy. In fact, about a month and a half ago, we were told, hey, you got this. Done deal. This is your rental. Only to find out the person who told us that didn't have the authority to tell us that. And the person who did says, no, you can't have it. So I've spent, along with the staff, well over 100 hours trying to find this facility. And here's the crazy thing. I know for a fact God's going to give it to us, probably in the 11th hour. That's just the way he works. But God's going to take care of it because God cares more about this new church start than I care. It's his bride, not mine. But God's taking his time. And I love God, but I certainly don't like him right now because it's not working out well. Another huge blessing is is we are growing by leaps and bounds here. We're back to our our pre-pandemic numbers, which means that here in the OS campus, we, we need more staff to keep up. We want to minister effectively to people. And so we got some openings, and we've got a great team who's put out job descriptions and interviews, and we're trying to make sure we find the right person with the right passion and experience, and, and the list goes on and on and on. But we haven't found those people yet. They haven't come just yet. They're, they're close. We kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel, and God cares, but it hasn't happened yet. And because it hasn't happened yet, it's stressing me out. And I love God, but I don't like Him because of it. But, but it's, not just, it's not just work, it's my family too. I mean, some of the biggest blessings, my daughter, she absolutely loves her travel soccer team, loves them. So excited to be back with them. We're excited because she loves the kids, we love the kids, we love the families. Can't wait, spring's kicking off. But we don't have all the details yet. I mean, people are working on it, they're working hard, but we don't know exactly when the dates are, exactly where we're going, how much it's going to cost. We know we're going, but we don't have the details. And I want the details right now. I mean, my daughter's 16 years old, so I would think I should have that info like 15 years ago. And it stresses me out. My son's graduating high school in, in two months. And, and uh, he's applied to about eight or nine colleges, has heard back from every one of them except for one he'll find out on April 1st. As God would have it, he got accepted to every one of them. But the problem is, every one of them costs a lot of money. And so right now, we have to wait because he has to make a decision by May 1st, but the universities he's applying to, they don't even release the final scholarship structure until mid-April. It's a game. And it's driving me crazy. I don't know if I need to buy my son a winter jacket or a swimsuit. I don't know. I I literally, seriously, catch this. I don't know if my son is going to be in Palo Alto, California, or Ann Arbor, Michigan. I have no idea. I don't know if he's going to be in Atlanta, Georgia, or the Bronx, New York. Actually, I know the Bronx. My wife said no, so that one's not happening. Okay, we know that. I don't know if my son's going to be in College Station or West Lafayette, Indiana. I have no idea. I don't know if I'm going to be driving or flying to see my son in six months. And it's driving me crazy. But it's one of the biggest blessings to have the opportunities he has. But because it's not my timing, it drives me nuts. And the problem with it driving me nuts and driving me crazy is it's making me feel exhausted. In fact, last week I went to bed by 8 o'clock like twice. 
uh, you know, that's really early for you young people. You're like, what? I saw this thing about the Amish recently, and they talk about all these different characteristics about the Amish, and they said they go to bed early, like 7.30 or 8, and I'm like, I didn't know I was Amish. <laughs> but I'm exhausted. But it's not just me that's exhausted. I- I'm exhausting everybody else around me. I mean, they're exhausted because I'm a stress ball over dumb stuff, stuff that's going to be taken care of. I just have to be fruitful and do my job. People are going to be fruitful and do their job, and, and everything's going to work out because God has got control. And, and you know what's so crazy about my desire to control the timing for things? I mean, you know this. I, I know this, but for some reason I just struggle with it. As soon as everything I'm stressed about right now is taken care of, it's going to be replaced by something else that I want to control the timing of. And, and, and we all do it because here's the deal. One of the biggest power struggles I deal with, I'm guessing one of the biggest power struggles you deal with is this idea that we want to control everything. Because we believe that if we can control it, even down to the timing, it'll bring us peace. But here's what's crazy. In our heart of hearts, we know that's not true, but yet we're still running that way. It's like a dog to their vomit. And we think if I can control it, I'll have peace, but we know that's not true. We know that, that the real peace is recognizing that God's in control. The real peace is saying, God, I'll follow you wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And, God, I'll be as fruitful as possible no matter what you bring into my life. And, and, and we know that when we have that mindset, we'll, we'll experience true peace even when God says wait. We'll have true peace even when God says no. And we'll have true peace even when God says hold tight because this is going to hurt a little bit. Because we know God's in control. Going back to our our verses, we're going to read verse 31 through 37 that proceed the ones we just read. And what we're going to find out is is that Jesus, he had just passed away. We just read that. He gave up his spirit. But even after his death, we learned that he is still in control. This is what it says. It says, now was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. Then soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it, now the man who saw it, John's referring to himself here. He says, the man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happen so the scripture will be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and and another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Now, in order for us to kind of understand what's going on here, we've got to put it in context. If you look back in, in verse 14, partnered with what we just read, saying it was the day before preparation, what we learn is it was the day before the Passover, now, normally, if it wasn't a special day coming up, they would, they would leave the people on the cross, on the cross, until they know for sure that they were dead, often long enough for flesh-eating birds and animals to start picking up their bodies and their faces. But because the next day was the Passover, they wanted to clean the, the, the land of any death or defilement. So they said, so this is what we need to do. We need to, we need to speed up their death. And a way that they would speed up their death is they would break their legs because when they're on the cross, they had nails in their feet. And the only way for them to breathe was to lift up so their lungs would expand, they could breathe, and then push and let themselves down. And so that's the only way that they could breathe is to push on that nail. But when they break their legs, they can no longer do that, so they couldn't push themselves up to breathe, thus they would suffocate in short order. Now this was typical. So they go to the first man, they break his legs. We're told he goes to the other man, the second man. And they break his legs, but then they come to Jesus, and they say, you know what, he's he's already dead, so we're not going to break his legs, we're going to put a spear in his side. This was very atypical, because whether they thought he was dead or not, they would normally break their legs, and they certainly didn't typically put a spear into his lungs, that wasn't common. wasn't common. And, and, And so we're sitting there saying, well, why in the world did this happen? And this happened because God was in control. And in his control, Jesus wanted to make sure that everybody there knew that the man that they just killed on the cross was actually God that was told about a thousand plus years ago. See, John said it this way. We'll go back to what we just read. He says, these things happen so the scriptures would be fulfilled. 
Not one of his bones will be broken, and another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. See, when John wrote those words, he's thinking back to the Old Testament. He's thinking about those, those prophets and those writers who God spoke through hundreds, thousands of years ago. When he wrote those words, he says, as scripture says, not one of his bones will be broken. They'll, they'll look at the one they are pierced. He's thinking of Exodus 12.10 and Numbers 19.12. And Psalm 34, 21. And Zechariah 12, 10. And Zechariah 13, 1. Along with some other verses. And so the question is, how in the world is it possible for writers thousands of years before it happened to accurately write what would and would not happen to the Messiah on the cross? And the answer is simple. God has always been in control. And so here's the deal. Is, as we close up our time today, I just want to remind you guys. That if, if God is powerful enough to be in control up to this point, if he's powerful enough to be in control of his own death, then he's powerful enough to be in control of our lives. And you know what? He deserves that authority in our lives. And if you're struggling with giving him that authority, I just want to remind you that you have like this limited view. And your view of this world and what's best typically is based upon what you want. But, but God has a much broader view. He knows what's best for us and for the world around us. And, and when we come to that point, we're saying, this, okay, we trust your control, even though at times it might not be my choice. But I trust your control, God, because I know that you know better. At that point and only at that point can we experience real peace. Because when we trust in God, we realize that sometimes the wait from God is for our character Sometimes the no from God is actually for our safety. And sometimes the pain and the hurt that we feel that God's allowed into our lives is actually for somebody else's faith, a faith that is built up in them because of the way we handle it. So here's my question. We're going to have a closing song. I'd encourage you to ponder it at that time, ponder it this week. What is it that's, that's waging war within you? What is that power struggle in your life that is not just crippling you, it's crippling the people around you, and it's driving a wedge between you and God? Because here's, here's what I know. When, when we have a power struggle for control with God, it always ends up with us doing things that are not the best choices. Maybe a power struggle is this. Maybe you, you've been at a job for a while, and you've been waiting for that promotion or that raise, and it, and it hasn't happened yet. And so what happens is that frustration within you is welling up, and you're, you think about everything you could do with that money you don't have yet. And so you start getting stressed out about it, and then you start getting stressed out about it, so you start getting angry at your boss, and ultimately you start getting angry at God because it hasn't happened yet. And so all of a sudden you've gone from this really great employee that it deserves a, a promotion or a raise, and now you become this nominal employee because you're not as focused on being excellent at work. Because of the power struggle within you. Maybe you're a young person in this room and you're sitting there thinking, man, I, I need to find that, that perfect mate. I mean, I'm really frustrated because I can't find them out there. And so it turns into this power struggle between us and God because, like, God, this is what I want, but you're not giving it to me. So, God, what's going on here? And so what happens is in the middle of that power struggle, instead of focusing on us and growing and maturing in the Lord, we start to become stagnant in our faith. Uh, my son says this all the time. He's 17. He says, here's the deal. He says, I got one job. My job is to live in such a way that the girl I'm looking for is looking for. That's, that's what it is. And what happens is this power struggle within us, it, it, it rages against that. And all of a sudden, we're not focused on being the type of person that we're looking for is looking for. Uh, this is a really hard one. This is, uh, my heart goes out for people like this. Maybe the challenge is this. Maybe your kids have fallen away from the Lord. I can't think of a bigger tragedy than that. Uh, it's breaking your heart. You, you, you can't talk to them about God. They want nothing to do with God. You can't talk to them about faith or church. They want nothing to do about it. And it, it's breaking your heart. But it's, it's frustrating you and it's stressing you out to the point that it's driving a wedge between you and them and between you and God. And so what happens is because it's driving a wedge between you and God, you're no longer trying to act like God in their life. You're not trying to take on the attributes of God. So every time you get together with them, you're, you're nagging to death on what they're doing, and you're failing to show them the love of God, the love of God that came to pay for the multitude of sins, and to show them the love of God that will hopefully draw them back to the faith. I don't know what you're struggling with. I know what I struggle with. I struggle with timing. And God still hasn't solved that problem in 46 years. I don't think he ever is. 
But, but what's that struggle that's, that's welling up within you that's causing stress and anxiety within you, causing stress and anxiety with other people, and ultimately waging war between you and the one who has authority and control in your life? What is it? Be honest with God. Here's, here's the great thing. God already knows your struggles. And God also knows that when we're honest with them, that's the first step in healing. That's the first step in saying, God, this is my struggle. I need your help. And then, guys, accept his help. Accept his sovereignty. Trust that he has the bigger picture in mind and trust him with every aspect, even the timing. Let's pray. God, as always, uh, we just always want to pause and and recognize that we're here uh, simply because you allow us to be here. God, there's nothing about us that's great or perfect, but Lord, you are. And so, God, as we study your word and, and we see uh, the fact that you were in control of even the last breath that you made here on earth, God, we praise you that the story wasn't done, that death was defeated three days later. And because of your sacrifice and your death, God, we have a payment for our sin and we can have a relationship with you. God, I, I pray for everybody in this room. God, I pray for those in this room that they don't know you. And God, the reason why they don't know you very possibly is because they're really having a hard time relinquishing control in their life over to you. God, I pray that you help them see that you have what's best in mind for them. God, you love them beyond all measure. God, there's people in this room like myself who are are followers of you. God, I think probably every one of us at some level that, God, we're just stressed out so much because we're just trying to control everything or aspects of things. And we're missing out on the peace that you provide. We're missing out on living the life that you're calling us to live by, by just trusting you, God. And so, God, I I do pray that we trust you. I I pray that we trust you with the weights. I pray we trust you with the no's. And I even pray that we trust you when hard times come. In your name we pray. Amen.